day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to our service of worship on this, the Lord's Day. A special welcome to all those who are guests with us this morning. As we gather for this Thanksgiving Sunday, we're delighted to have you with us and to gather the people of God here around the table. We have special guests with us today that I'm breathless I'm so excited about. <laughs> um, you, you see an announcement in your bulletin regarding the, uh, no, I'm sorry, we pulled the announcement out. Rochelle, help me out here. <laughs> we have been um, the gracious hosts to the Jewish Women's Artist Circle for a number of months, surrounded by their gifts in various pieces of art. And today, all of that comes to a culmination with the table spread before us with a spectacular tablecloth that you've seen out in the comments for the last number of weeks, and a number of the artists of that tablecloth and other pieces we have shared here with us to participate in worship and join us for our time of fellowship together. Uh, some who are here will be with us uh, in the worship service leadership and others are just visiting, but I want you to join me in welcoming Paula, Amy, uh, Ronnie, Joyce, and Kirsten. Did I get it? like to greet them and speak to them about any of the art and particularly about the tablecloth, it seemed like we wanted to bring you all up front to stand around the table with them. So if you'd like to greet them after worship, come forward to the table and then they will come out and join us. We'll save a few donuts, I promise. <laughs> then they'll come out and join us for our time of fellowship together. Friends, there is so much going on uh, and so much to celebrate in this place. Today we celebrate the Sacrament of Communion, and I remind you that all are welcome at the table. We will be celebrating by intention this morning, which means there will be four stations. Move to the one closest to you, and our request is that you move, you come either forward or to the rear of the sanctuary by the center aisle, and return to your pew by the side aisles. That way we don't crash into each other. There will be four serving stations, two forward and two at the back. And if you prefer not to leave your pew at all, please signal an usher who will be watching for us, and we will bring the elements to you at your pew. We're delighted to be celebrating on this Thanksgiving Sunday and preparing ourselves for the season of Advent, which begins next week. There are a number of announcements in your bulletin regarding things happening in Advent, but the one I'm most looking forward to happens on December 9th, the second Sunday of Advent, in the afternoon. We will be having our anniversary party. This congregation is 125 years old, and it is a great reason for a celebration. You notice the table as you came in this morning. There are tickets and various other things to do with the party there at the table, and we want to make sure everyone has a chance to purchase those, to participate in the party, to be a part of what's going on. But we also want to note that the primary reason for this party beyond the celebration of God's work with us as a people of God for 125 years is to renew and, and add to our legacy fund. So I invite you this morning to think about your legacy in this place. What is it that you leave for those who come after all of you? And in the same way, what has been left for you? What brings you here? Who's been here before you? And how have they made that possible? Your gift to the legacy <coughs> is a part of this anniversary celebration. And we do hope that you will participate. Please stop by the table this morning before you leave church and participate in the legacy fund as well as getting your, yourself and your family all signed up for that party. The deacons have a Christmas tree in the commons. We are adopting some families from neighbors. 
Our youth groups are doing that same project next Sunday. There's all sorts of information about what else is coming up, and I invite you to peruse that at your leisure. Now, I invite you, oh, I'm sorry. I put this on a long sheet of paper so it would stick up. One more announcement, forgive me, Becky. We're delighted to announce uh, that Linda Calver let us know that Becky Calver and Dustin Fisher had their new baby. Carter James Fisher was born on Thanksgiving Day. What a gift, what a blessing. At nine pounds, six ounces, 22 inches long. Carter is still, Carter is still hospitalized with some lung issues, but mom and baby are doing okay and everything looks to be just fine. And we celebrate with the Calver family and the Fishers, this new arrival among us. We do hope, if you want to let Becky know, we do hope that Carter will make an appearance on Christmas Eve to stand in as our baby Jesus in the pageant. We'll, we'll have to talk to him as he grows up a little bit. Friends, now let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of God this day. Will you join me in a time of centering silence? Yugoslavia 
and after staying there with partisans, she made her way back to Hungary, where she was captured by the Nazis and executed at 23 years old. She was a hero and a poet, and the words that are about to be offered are from one of her poems, followed by some beautiful singing. <coughs> The title of this poem is Eli Eli, which means, My God, My God. I pray that these things never end, the sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the heart, the sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the heart. Eli.
mercy and forgiveness. The truth is not in us, and we are only deceiving ourselves. But if we come before God and one another, earnestly confessing where we have strayed from the way revealed to us in Jesus, God hears our prayers and offers us a fresh start and new life. Please join me in our prayer for forgiveness. Gracious God, we confess that we go through life too often unaware of your presence and provision. We take for granted what we've been given. We consider it a right to have what we have. We believe we've earned it all and can now rest on our morals. God, we are slow to give thanks and even slower to return a portion of our gifts to you. Forgive us for neglecting to honor and thank you for all that you are and all that you've done for us. Remind us of our many blessings, forgive our selfish ways, and transform us into who you would have us be. Amen. God does not put us to shame, but deals wondrously with us restoring our fortunes and blessing us with peace. God desires our salvation, our healing, our embracing of truth. Therefore, we are not to worry. The gifts of God are known to all who seek God's reign and do God's will. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
said to him, Man, who appointed me as judge or referee between you and your brother? <coughs> then Jesus said to all of them, Watch out. Guard yourself against all kinds of greed. After all, one's life isn't determined by one's possessions, even when someone is very wealthy. Then he told them all a parable. A certain rich man's land produced a bountiful crop. He said to himself, what will I do? I have no place to store my harvest. Then he thought, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's where I'll store all my grain and my goods. I'll say to myself, you have stored up plenty of goods, enough for several years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, fool, tonight you will die. Now who will get the things you have prepared for yourself? This is the way it will be for those who hoard things for themselves and aren't rich for God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A couple weeks ago, I attended a two-day seminar hosted by the Board of Pensions of the Presbyterian Church USA. Now, the Board of Pensions has been taking care of Presbyterian clergy and church workers for as long as there has been a Presbyterian church. They provide our health insurance and our pension plan, which I learned at the seminar is funded at 112% currently, so that's a relief. The event I attended was called Growing Into Tomorrow Today and was billed as a pre-retirement planning workshop. I had to do 10 pages of homework prior to attending, including my current household budget and my estimated household budgets for the next 15 years. Over the two days of the seminar, we looked at estimated costs, at health care options, at housing possibilities, at family needs, ministry transitions, service opportunities, IRAs, 403Bs, Medicare, Social Security, investments, and much more. While all that may be a very good exercise, it did not, I will admit, bring me much comfort or assurance that I can plan for an eventual retirement. In fact, I've decided I may just have to work forever in order to avoid all that. I did come away from the event with the distinct impression that while I know money can't buy me love, the Board of Pensions would have me believe that it sure as heck can buy me a better retirement if I just would start saving it and stop spending it. Are you a diamond ring, my friend? <coughs> if it makes you feel all right, I'll get you anything, my friend. If it makes you feel all right, I don't care too much for money. Money can't buy me love. It sounds so good when the Beatles sing it, remember? And we're with them. We, that's what we believe, right? Money can't buy us love. But I'm ready to stand in front of you all today and say that as much as I want to believe that, want to act that, want to know that, I don't. It's not that I actually don't have enough. It's more often that I think, and I believe, and I act like I don't have enough. Enough money, enough stuff, enough life. And for that matter, I live in a culture that regularly confirms it for me. Television and radio commercials, billboards and store displays, every single thing on the internet. All not only tell me that I'm insufficient, that I'm incomplete, that I'm not quite right on my own, but they also promise me that if I only buy the product that they're pushing at the moment, fresher mouthwash, newer cell phone, bigger car, then, then I will be complete, right? Our culture, friends, unequivocally equates consumption with satisfaction, and possessions with happiness, and material wealth with the good life. And here's my problem. I tend to believe it. Don't get me wrong, I know that's not true. Actually, I 
and know that it's a complete lie. And I can take as evidence not only the multiple biblical prescriptions warning against greed, but also all the current studies that measure national happiness, where the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, ranks in the bottom 10% in regard to reported happiness. I suspect most every one of us here right now could admit that we have more money or at least more stuff today than we did 10 years ago, but we aren't happier than we were 10 years ago. So I know that as a rule, money doesn't make us happier, can't buy me love, but deep down inside, I wonder secretly if I might be the exception to that rule. If I just had a chance, right, to get ahead a little bit, might I not be happier, more relaxed, more at peace? I'll give you all I've got to give if you say you'll love me too. I may not have a lot to give, but what I've got I'll give to you. I don't care too much for money. Money can't buy me love, can't buy me love. Everybody tells me so, can't buy me love. No, 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 no. And so we come to the parable. Jesus tells us about that rich fool. What I'm admitting today is that I, I identify a little too closely with this guy. After all, he's not a cheat. He's not a thief. He's not even particularly greedy when we first meet him. He just worked hard, had a good harvest, made a lot of money, and kind of like I sometimes, maybe most of us, dream about. But his mistake in the end doesn't have to do with his wealth, his bountiful harvest. Rather, I believe he goes astray by believing that that wealth is what's going to secure his future can make him independent, if you will, from others, from need, and especially from God. I catch myself dreaming that sometimes, do you? If I just had a little more in the bank, if my credit cards actually were paid off, if the cash for my kid's college education was already saved up, or fill in the blank, then everything would be okay. The allure of money, my friends, is I think it creates the illusion of independence for us. It somehow promises us that we can transcend the everyday vulnerabilities of everyone else, that remind us that we're mortal, that we're created beings, ultimately dependent on others, most especially dependent on God. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. Not in this parable, and not in life. Jesus doesn't actually warn against money, or wealth, or material abundance. He warns against greed, against that insatiable feeling we have of never quite having enough. Think about it. This farmer's problem is not that he's had a great harvest. It's not that he's rich, not that he wants to plan for his retirement, right? The farmer's problem is that his good fortune has so skewed his vision that everything he sees starts and ends with himself. Listen again to the conversation he has. Not with a spouse, not with his children, not with friends or neighbors or a parent, but just with himself. Here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's where I'll store all my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you have stored up plenty of goods, enough for several years. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. See what I mean? It's an absolutely egocentric conversation. He even includes a conversation with himself inside of the conversation that he's already having with himself. This, I think, is why he is labeled a fool. He's fallen prey to the notion that life, particularly the good life, consists of possessions, which is exactly what Jesus has warned us against. But what then does the good life consist of, friends? 
If it's not about the money, what is it about? Say you don't need no diamond ring, I'll be satisfied. Tell me that you want the kind of thing that money just can't buy. I don't care too much for money, money can't buy me love. What does the good life consist of, my friends? Read the rest of what Jesus says across the Gospels. Look at what God is doing throughout all of Holy Scripture, and it becomes very clear. Relationships. Relationships with each other, and relationship with God. Of course, these two can't ever really be separated, right? Jesus tells stories like the parable of the Good Samaritan, that invite us to think more broadly about who we imagine being our neighbor. And he preaches sermons that extol caring for the poor, loving our enemies, doing good for all those in need. Now, check me if I'm wrong, but in my study, I can't once find when Jesus lifts up setting up a retirement account or securing a high payer job as part of seeking the kingdom of God. Now that doesn't mean those things are bad, really. Money can do, we all know, lots of wonderful things. It provides for you and your family. It is given to those in need. It can be used to create jobs and promote the general welfare of everyone. It can indeed make more possible a comfortable life. It just can't produce. It just can't produce the kind of full and abundant life that each one of us seeks and that God promises for us. So it's not about the money. It's not about the money. It's about our attitude toward the money and toward those around us. <coughs> that counts. So I admitted already that I identify a little too closely with the rich guy sometimes. Maybe you do too. Maybe you've had a bountiful harvest. Maybe you have a good job. Maybe you care for your family comfortably and well. But truth be told, I think most of us know and believe that what the scripture tells us is true. We know that money can't buy us love or happiness or security. And the thing is, even though we know it, most of us still struggle to live it. I think so many of us are seduced by the same message that captures the soul of this farmer in the parable. Materialism, consumerism, affluenza, whatever you want to call it, has a distinct advantage over the abundant life that Jesus commends to us because it is, in fact, immediately tangible. And relationships, community, purpose, the kinds of things that Jesus invites us to embrace and strive for, those are a whole lot harder to get our hands on and to get our heads around. We do know what a good relationship feels like, yes, but it's hard to point to it. And it's very hard to produce on a moment's notice. And we know that wonderful feeling of being accepted, welcomed into a community, but it's not like you can run out to that new high B and buy it, right? So we substitute material goods for those immaterial things. Because, well, there they are right in front of us, and we've got that whole culture telling us that we need this and that it's the best there is. What then should we do, friends? What should we do? We should talk about it. We should resist it. We should support one another. We should gather at the table, at your Thanksgiving tables a few days ago, at your breakfast table this morning, at the lunchroom table at work tomorrow, and at the community table in a restaurant, and at family tables and coffee shop tables, and this stunningly beautiful table. We should gather at table and share meals and talk about our blessings and name what it is that fills us up. The 
elements of abundant life that are woven throughout all of scripture, things like relationship and community and love and trust and care and purpose, those may be less tangible, but I'm here to tell you they're far more powerful than any material goods. And each one of us, each one of us can experience these marks of abundant life every single day even though the entire media universe pushes us instead to tune into something that's negative or missing or lacking in our lives, rather than what's positive and fulfilling and right, right in front of us. What then should we do? What then should we do? Maybe, maybe you'll begin a new daily practice of gratitude. A blessing journal, something like that. Maybe you'll just be more aware of the tables you gather at, the people that you sit with, and where you are filled. What I know for sure is that our practices shape our beliefs and our attitudes, and anything like this will have almost immediate positive outcomes. So will it rescue us from mindless materialism? usher us suddenly right into the middle of the kingdom of God? No, sadly, <laughs> it won't. But the promise I hear in this text today is that God wants so much more for us, friends, than barns full of stuff. God wants for us life and love and mercy and community. The problem isn't our money. But it is our inclination to look to our money rather than looking to God and one another for our life. The problem isn't our money, but our inclination to look to our money rather than to God and each other for life. Money can't buy me love, nor can it buy any of us life. Not really. Only God holds that for us. Thanks be to God. Amen. All our gifts, all our bounty comes to us from a gracious and generous God. And so as an act of worship, we bring our gifts, a portion of our blessings, and return them to God that the kingdom might come in.
My name is Amy Orkin, and I'm part of the Interfaith Artist Group. And we started as a women's Jewish artist circle, and we are so honored and thankful to Rochelle for making this possible, and for the pastors for being interested and in having our artwork up and our table. And um, I just was, they asked me to explain the process of how we created this tablecloth, and um, I just, it's about welcoming guests and hospitality, and there's room at the table, and there's a quote on here that says, Humans are the only species that share food with strangers. And in this time of difficult time in places of worship, we are so honored that you're welcoming us here and that we're creating a larger community. And it's no longer enough for us just to be in our own synagogue or our own mosque, but it's important for us to connect with each other at this time. So. It's very timely for Thanksgiving for us to be with you here today. Thank you. Um, thank you. So this is a batik tablecloth. It's an ancient art form where you paint with hot wax and then you paint with dye. And when we became a community of interfaith artists, I asked the women to bring one um, food to share from their family or tradition, and we all went around and shared the food, and, the, um, and then we all created our placemats. And each placemat has um, who we are and how we connect to community. And so this is mine. And we have about six other artists here today that at the end of the service will be here to share um, their placemat and other placemats and how we connect to community. And I'll just share my um, prayer is how I connect, connect to community, singing, um, touch, nature, and listening. And that's just my piece, and we all have different pieces here to share. Uh, I was inspired by the artist Judy Chicago. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she has a dinner party exhibit at the Brooklyn Art Museum. She was the first woman artist I learned about in college, and she created a dinner party with placemats that in place settings of all the women through time that contributed. And it's an amazing collaborative art piece. That was the first art piece that really spoke to me and motivated me to become an artist. And so I'm about collaboration, and I like to get everybody at the table. So that's just a little bit about me. Oh, Angie Haida is a ceramicist, and she created a cup for each artist in our group, and she asked each artist what fills their cup, and she wrote a little quote inside and a little drawing and created these ceramics. Tea, tea cups for each artist in the group. She made this teapot, and um, she couldn't be with us today, but she has been. She was here like two weeks ago, so um, that's Angie's connection to this. So thank you for having us, and uh, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Come, children of God, 
Come and remember with us. Let us bow together in prayer. It is right and a good and hopeful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. From the rising of the sun to its setting, your name is praised among all peoples. Holy are you, almighty God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. In the power of the Spirit, you created all things. You blessed them and called them good. You called to yourself a people to make your mercy and truth known in all the world. But we betrayed your calling, and you were faithful. We wandered from your way, and you called us back and led us home. Still we turn from your ways, we abused your creatures, and we made ourselves slaves to sin and death. But at the right time, you came and dwelt among us, as one of us, bringing good news to the poor, healing the sick, raising the dead, sharing table with the unrighteous, and teaching the way that leads to a life of hope. It is by your incarnation, your life and suffering, your execution and resurrection, that you gave birth to the hope that is your church, <coughs> delivered us from slavery and made a new covenant with us by water and by the Spirit. And so we come before you this morning, Holy One, offering ourselves and offering to you our prayers for others, prayers for family members, for friends, for members of this community, and for those in other communities whose names we do not even know. We pray especially this day for Mary Ann Shane's brother Bill, who is having surgery tomorrow. We pray for the two and a half year old son of Chris Ross's co worker, Adrian who had a brain tumor removed last week. And we pray for the family who awaits the biopsy report. We pray for Jean Bohr in the hospital with pneumonia and atrial fib fibrillation. We give thanks for the birth of Carter James Fisher and for his family. We pray for those in California who have lost their homes to fires and especially those who have lost their lives and the families that grieve those losses. And we give thanks for those who have put their own lives on the line, putting out those fires, saving homes and saving lives. We pray for the family who who's victim to the explosion this past week on the east side. The explosion is near where Cal Ross lives, and they felt the explosion in their home in many ways. And we continue to pray for peace. Peace throughout your world. We pray for all of the places of violence in your creation in our nation, in our own communities, and that we would be instruments of your peace in all that we say and do. On the night of your betrayal, Jesus, you took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to your disciples and said, this is my body given for you. When you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. And then you did the same with the cup after supper, saying, in and through this cup is the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Holy One, pour out your Spirit now upon us. Pour out your Spirit on these gifts. Make us, through them, Christ's body alive in the world. And so hear us as we join our voices together in prayer, using the words Jesus gave to his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. 
Whoever believes in me will never hunger. Whoever trusts in me will never thirst. Come, for the table is ready, and all God's children are welcome.
bounty, life on earth meets much hardship. At this time of harvest, as the weather turns, we prepare for the coming winter. We pray for the strength to endure the coming cold, and we give thanks for the food and the fuel which will help us to survive it. As we prepare, as we prepare for the future, we remember also the past. All of us hold in our hearts the memories both of joy and of sorrow. We give thanks for the happiness we have known, and we pray that we may survive the hardships of the spirit as well as the body. As this winter is made easier by the harvest stores and the knowledge of following spring, so may our spiritual winters be made easier by the memory of joy and of good things still to come. So may it be. Amen.